Namaste. So every yoga school, every religion says that it has the ultimate truth. <laughs> if you go to the Hatha yoga schools, they say, oh, we have the ultimate truth. Everybody else is the useless nonsense. And then if you go to the karma yoga schools, which usually masquerade as bhakti yoga, but they're so heavily into rituals and ceremonies, and it's karma yoga. And anyway, they say, oh, no, no, we have the ultimate truth. And you follow this method and you get the greatest enlightenment. Go to heaven, whatever. But then the bhakta yogis come along and they say, no, 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 love of God is the highest truth. All those ceremonies are just preliminary. And then you go to the meditators and they say, no, 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 meditation is the highest truth. Samadhi, nirvana, nibbana. Huh? This is the highest truth. And all that other stuff is just preliminary if it has any value at all. Huh? And then who is actually the highest? What is actually the highest? Well, the Yoga Sutras and most books on yoga and spiritual life, including the Buddha's teaching, talk about samadhi or nirvana, nibbana, uh, or meditation on emptiness, on nothingness, as being the highest. Because in that state, everything of a dualistic nature is nullified, kicked out, suppressed, rejected, negated, invalidated. <laughs> and nothing is left. Only nothing is left. And this is supposed to be the highest. Well, Mandukya Upanishad does not agree. But this is kind of looking back at the third chapter of Mandukya Upanishad that we just went through. And this is a wonderful chapter for so many reasons. But I think the greatest reason is that it blows up the myth of emptiness or nothingness being the ultimate. Brahman is the source of everything, including emptiness. Because who is cognizing emptiness? Who is aware of emptiness? See, that's the one thing all these meditation schools kind of forget to talk about. The self. Even if you get rid of everything else, the individual identity, the body, the mind, the world, the senses, <laughs> phenomena, memories, all of that, yeah, you dump it overboard, neti neti. <laughs> You still have the self, the pure awareness, consciousness of consciousness, turiya. Huh? You can't get rid of that no matter how hard you try. <laughs> so, Mandukya Upanishad talks about Aslesha Yoga. And asleshi means it's none of that. It has nothing to do with that. It's not related. It's not connected. It's kind of a contradiction in terms because yoga means connection, hooking up one thing to another. But aslesha means unconnected, uncaused, neither cause nor effect. And of course, this is Brahman. So when one realizes Brahman, he realizes, here I am, apparently in the world, 
but I have nothing to do with this world. I am not a cause nor an effect of this world. That's all due to duality, which is something else. It's just an illusion. It's not even real. Snake and rope. Huh? Clay and pot. <laughs> Golden necklace. The world is nothing but Brahman. But it's not Brahman. It's separate from Brahman. And that's the illusion. The separateness of it is the total illusion. Because there cannot be separateness from Brahman. Only Brahman exists. Period. End of story. There is nothing else. So if something else appears, it's just an appearance. It's like a mirage of water in the desert. You know, we've been over this a bunch of times. So the other name for this is Asparsha Yoga. There's Aslesha and Asparsha. Aslesha means no connection, has nothing to do with anything. And Asparsha means embracing, accepting everything. So how are these two the name of the same thing? Well, they're just talking about two different aspects. Asparsha means Brahman, which is unconnected with everything. And Aslesha means because everything is simply an illusion, I don't try to negate it. I don't try to deny it. I don't try to get rid of it, make it go away. I don't try to run away from it. I accept it. I embrace it. It's okay. Because it's just a show. It's just an illusion. It can't hurt me. It can't harm me. It can sometimes amuse me. <laughs> but really, it has nothing to do with me. It's like going to the cinema on a Saturday night and sitting there eating popcorn and watching, you know, whatever. Or say, you know, Netflix and chill, right? At the end, the movie's finished and it goes off and, and everybody goes to bed. So this world is the same way. It's just a show. It's simply for the edification and entertainment of Brahman as Shiva. Shiva and Shakti. See, Brahman becomes Shiva to be the Ishwar, the controller of the world. And because he fundamentally has nothing to do, he creates Shakti, Maya, that which is not, as his energy. And she does all the work of creation and maintenance and destruction of the worlds. See? So the yogi who realizes this, who merges with Shiva, and who realizes Brahman, he's okay with all of this because this is his self. This is who he really is. So he doesn't feel like he has to run away from the world or deny it or suppress it or somehow um, disconnect from the senses like in Samadhi. He doesn't feel like he has to artificially concentrate the mind, <laughs> which is like I've said, like trying to cram a spring into a, a little uh, box or container, you know? As soon as you let go of the pressure, boing, out comes the spring. It, it, it's never contained. It's like trying to put a monkey in a cage, you know? Try it sometime. The mind is always active and it's always reactive to what is around it. It's not independent. And it's totally predictable in the sense that it's always going to resist any attempt at discipline <laughs> or, uh, you know, keeping it boxed in a certain little area, confinement. 
<laughs> so, um, but the mind is not me. The mind is not myself. The mind is not who I am. Same with the body. Same with the senses and the world that they reveal. None of this is the self. Not even the empirical self. What to speak of the actual self with a capital S. The consciousness and the being. Satchit Ananda. Consciousness, being, consciousness, and bliss in that order. So absolute being is the substrate of absolute consciousness, which is the substrate of absolute enjoyment or bliss. Satchit Ananda. This describes Brahman. Brahman is fine all by itself. Somebody one time tried to tell me, Brahman creates the world because he's bored, just sitting there looking at the light. <laughs> I don't know where people get these crazy ideas. Brahman is perfectly satisfied because all of Brahman's desires are automatically, immediately satiated. So there is no question of unhappiness for Brahman. Because it, Brahman cannot have desires. As soon as Brahman has a desire, boom, it manifests. It happens. So in the Upanishads, it is said, Brahman said, I am one, let me become many. Boom, material world is created. Boom, Shiva and Shakti, Pradhan, Mahatattva, huh? the tattvas, the 36 material tattvas, or 24 or 27 or however you count them, according to different schools. But anyway, the tattvas, the ingredients of the material creation, manifest automatically. Brahman doesn't have to do anything. Brahman doesn't even have to think about it. This is all done automatically. Why? Because Brahman desired, let me become many. Who knows why? It's, it doesn't even, I mean, I'm a big one for asking why. You know, if you look back at the videos, the history of this channel, I'm always asking why. I'm always going into how. You know, I love the Buddha because everything he teaches, he explains why and how. And I call this engineering mentality. It's the kind of inquisitive, research-based mindset that engineers have that allow them to create new inventions and so on. But this is neither here nor there with Brahman, because with Brahman, he simply desires, and poof, whatever he desires comes into being automatically. And the mechanism and the function of it is designed automatically by like infinite intelligence. There's no sense asking why, because Brahman is the absolute. He doesn't need a reason, you know? So anyway, this whole world exists and we find ourselves in these bodies. And so there's no reason to fight it because we are the ones who made it. Well, we are the one who made it. So Ashlesha Yoga means to embrace all this and not try to deny it. And this attitude, but, but not be disturbed by it either because we have really no relation to it. It's simply an illusion. So just like you don't get upset when crazy things happen in a video or in a movie. Huh? I mean, maybe some stupid people do. <laughs> but anyone who's intelligent realizes this is not me. This is not my life. This is not real. It's only an illusion, an illusion within an illusion. 
and you can add as many layers of illusion as you want. It doesn't make it true. So in the same way, this material world, it's not our self, but as long as it's there, we might as well enjoy it. We might as well live in it and accept it as it is without getting entangled. This is the key, because as soon as we become attached, as soon as we become identified, as soon as we begin to desire in this world as an individual, we suffer. So that's really the message of this third chapter of the Karaka, in a nutshell, that beyond samadhi, beyond nirvana, beyond meditation, beyond yoga, beyond everything, there is this state of Turiya. And this is really the ultimate enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.